Hi, everyone. Thank you for being so patient. And we welcome you to our 7EDU open class. A brief history about 7EDU. Our goal is to provide quality test prep to our students and unlock your unique potential. We are a team of experts and strategies that have helped students not only in the Bay Area, but also around the world achieve perfect standardized test scores. Not only do we personalize the learning experience to each individual learner, but we also help develop academic confidence and success. In today's open class, we have Dr. Yan Lu speaking. Um, our topic will focus on the key critical reasoning strategies that will help you ace your SAT reading and math. Um, the structure of today's class will go through strategies with Dr. Yan Lu, and we'll also answer real questions from both our students and parents. If you stay until the very end, we always have a secret bonus waiting for our viewers. So um, Dr. Yan today will be our speaker and she's a tenured college professor. She's right there on the screen if you guys can see her. <laughs> um, with over 18 years of experience mentoring her students, you can set her tips and strategies to help you succeed. Her strong passion for education has guided students to realize their potential and increase not only their test scores, but also their problem solving skills. I'll, I'll be handing this over to Dr. Yan so she can go ahead and start her open class for you guys. Hi, Dr. Yan. Hi, thank you, Kathy, for the introduction. Of course. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so like Kathy introduced, an SMET Impact Academy, we help students learn how to study smarter, not necessarily harder. But since today's topic is about a test, a standard test, SAT in particular, so I want to tell you how you can test smarter, not necessarily harder. When I, introduce, when I ask my students this question, I heard like students feedback and some students told me that uh, to test smarter, you need to really focus during the test. So don't get distracted. You have to double check the answer, making sure that you, uh, you uh, did your calculation correctly. Uh, you cannot be too nervous. Uh, you need to have a good sleep the night before. Okay, these are all very good answers and that can help us to uh, get a good score. But today I will tell you a very simple rule uh, that I want you to remember how you can test smarter uh, to do well in a test. That simple statement is just only do the necessary work. Okay, I cannot emphasize that um, uh, strongly enough because I have seen students doing unnecessary work or doing actual work that does not help them answer the question correctly or quickly. Okay, so of course I will tell you today what are the necessary work that you need to do in reading and the math. Okay, a caveat here is that uh, I'm only saying doing the necessary work during the test. I'm not saying that you only want you to get by uh, with the minimum work outside the test. Okay, during our regular study and actually you want to be a thorough, don't just um, uh, con con be content with knowing the minimum. Okay, so here's a quick outline, uh, the, outline uh, the things that I will share with you today. I will start with SAT reading. Uh, because that's the, uh, that's the section that most students have the most struggle with in SAT. So I will tell you an overview of SAT reading and for those uh, students or parents who are still not familiar with the structure of the reading section, and I will tell you some very important rules of SAT reading and then some of the things that you should do or should not do while you're working on the reading section, then followed by the math. Okay, now in the SAT reading section, there are totally five passages. The first passage is always the literature, uh, um, the prose, or the fiction. And then uh, that passage will follow by four nonfiction passages. The last passage is always science passage. So the middle three could be history passage, social science passage, or, and the one more science passage. So, so basically there will be two science passages, two passages that come uh, that are history passage or social science passages. But if you look at the topics that are covered by those passages, they are very, very broad. Okay, so does that mean a student really needs to have domain knowledge of those fields? Of course, the answer is no. These are just high school students. Okay, as it is for high school students, although um, sometimes the content or they require a lot from a high school students. Okay, so the most important thing I want to tell you, which may surprise you, is that as a re SAT reading, is an actually an objective test, as objective as the math section. 
Okay, you have to have that mindset while working on the reading sections. Now, the reason is simple. If it is a subject test, that means every student can come with his or her own answer. If that's the case, there will be no correct answer. Okay, so in that case, we cannot do this test. At least we cannot have a multiple choice for the reading section. Since that's a multiple choice section, that means there can be only one correct answer. So one and only one answer is 100% correct. It's not because I think it's correct, it's not because someone else thinks it's correct, it's because the passage says it's correct. So in other words, every word in the answer has to be supported in the passage. Okay, so remember this, you can only find your answer based on what the passage tells us. You also have to read very carefully and precisely, meaning that you can only read what is in the passage, not adding anything, not taking anything out. Okay, so not anything, uh, not missing anything important from the passage, not, and, not adding anything based on your previous knowledge, based on your background knowledge. Okay, uh, so I, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you're not expected to become an expert on the topic because the topics can be very broad. Okay, for the science passage, they can test earth science. They can test biology, um, uh, some species. Okay, so these topics are remote to most high school students. Okay, the good news is that you really don't need any external knowledge to do well in this section. So you only need to care about the part that supports the correct answer, the part in the passage that supports the correct answer. Okay, so here are the three common concerns I have seen among our students. Number one, probably is the most common one. Students feel very tight with time, okay? And the many students, when they first uh, did our diagnostic test, um, they could not finish the test, okay? Basically, they, like the last passage, you can see like most mistakes are in the last passage because they didn't have time to do the last passage. And also, some students cannot stay focused on the passage, especially when, we read, when they read a passage that they don't fully understand, a passage that can be very difficult to understand. It's most, um, uh, most especially the history passage, or sometimes the literature, um, especially because the literature passage or history passage uh, could be written, the original source was written uh, many years ago. Okay, so the language was hard to understand. And then, um, uh, the third one, which is also very common, is that students second guess the questions. They just feel that, okay, um, most of students actually can eliminate two answer choices, just between the two remaining two answer choices and they start guessing. Okay, they use that, their gut feeling to answer the questions. Okay, so the assumptions or the, the habits that students have that create those concerns or the problems or troubles in the test are that they think they have the time to read or they should take their time to read. They need to memorize details. And uh, I have seen a very a good student. Uh, she was a very avid reader and I have no doubt about her reading uh, comprehension ability. However, she didn't do well when she started with SAT, uh, when, when, she, when she started preparing for SAT. Then I, later I found out when she approached a reading passage, she basically read all the details in that passage, trying to fully understand the passage and then try to memorize the detail. And then when she move on to the question part, they just work on the questions pure based on her memory. And guess what? Most of her answers are wrong because the details are very easy to miss. Our memory actually is very fragile trying to memorize those minute details. And the SAT, the test makers knows the uh, our, uh, our weakness and they, they intentionally build those details with some twisted um, uh, discrepancy between the answer choice and the, what the passage says. And if we just roughly overall look at the answer choice, it seems that 90% of the answer choice match what we remembered uh, while reading the passage and then we pick the right answer, we, then we pick the answer and that answer is wrong. Okay, so of course you cannot use a gut instinct when answering questions. Remember, the evidence of the source of the correct answer comes from the passage. So you have to rely on what the passage tells us to choose the answer, not by our gut instinct, not by our 
um, uh, uh, our because our casting is affected by our external knowledge or our background knowledge, which is big no no in an SAT. Okay, so these are the wrong habits. Please don't do this. Okay, so like I said, please don't memorize details. There's no use. Okay, you really don't know which part of detail will be tested. In fact, very few questions test details. Okay, so basically you waste your time trying to memorize details and then none of the question ask for it. Even the ask for detail question, you cannot base on your memory when answering those questions. You always have to go back. And I have heard students telling me that they spend a lot of time reading a passage, especially if a passage is very hard to understand. They spend a lot of time trying to understand a very long, complicated sentence. Okay, that's, again, waste your time. Okay, because that part will never be tested. Even if a question test, um, it seems to test that part, a, a sentence that seems very long and complicated, they will never ask the meaning of a sentence. Actually, there's no question in SAT that asks the meaning of a sentence. Well, you may be asked um, to pick the best answer choice that um, uh, close to the meaning of a word, but we call that vocab in context. Okay, so we we was we will be tested with uh, uh, with interpreting the meaning of a word in the context of passage, but we will never be asked to interpret a sentence in the passage. Even if a question asks like refers to a particular sentence, it always asks that why the author uses this, why the author says this. It's a purpose question, not a detail question. So where the answer, what's the answer? The answer is in the context not in particular sentence. So in fact, when I teach students to answer a function problem, and I notice that students are very easy to be trapped by the meaning of a particular sentence, I ask them to cover that sentence. Okay, don't look at that sentence. You have to look at the sentence before, the information before and after. The answer always comes from the context. The answer cannot come from that particular sentence. That's called a function problem, okay? Yeah, so basically, if you see a very long, complex sentence, if you don't understand it, just move on. Okay, each sentence should be just read once. Unless you're pretty sure a sentence tells you the main idea. Okay, you cannot miss the main idea. Okay, main idea is very important. But even if a sentence is the main idea that you don't think you fully understand, main idea is the part that connects the entire passage. If that is so important, it will not be just described once. You will be able to see that, a paraphrase, of course, a main idea in other parts of the passage. So you just keep reading, okay? Okay, so how you can achieve effective reading in SAT? That means you need to know what to focus on while working on a passage. Okay, now I need to tell you what you should read or what, should, what you should pay attention. You should read carefully the intro paragraph. Now, each of the SAT reading passages start with the intro paragraph. And many students actually uh, completely uh, skip that part because they feel that they, have, they should go directly to the passage. Okay, I can tell you and um, that whole intro paragraph is very, very important. Okay, from the intro paragraph, we can tell the type of passage. Sometimes, sometimes we, can yield, we can even tell the main topic of the passage. So what is that phenomenon or that person or that social, um, uh, social issue, which is the main topic of the passage. I would say at least 60 or 70% of time we can tell the main topic from the intro paragraph. The author's attitude, very important, especially for history passage or for social science passage, because history passage or social science passage always have author's opinion, author, author's attitude. Usually uh, you, just need, uh, you just need to know whether the author has a negative attitude or positive attitude for a particular issue or particular uh, social phenomenon. The time period sometimes tells us, uh, gives an expectation on how difficult the language would be. Okay, we know that history passage is always written more than 50 years ago, so we can expect that language can be a little hard to understand. For literature, sometimes it's a modern novel, or sometimes it's a it's a novel um, written more than 100 years ago. Okay, so if we end up with a novel that was written many years ago, and then we can have expectation on how um, how uh, antiquated language would be, okay? All right, here are just some examples. You can see that the first example says, passage one was adapted from a 1976 article about environmentalism. Passage two was adapted from 2005 analysis of environmental move, 
movement from 1970s. Actually, the intro paragraph already tells us the relationship between these two passages. Okay, the main topic, actually these two passages describe the same main topic, that's of environmental movement. Okay, by looking at when the passage, the, uh, when the original passage was written, you can see the second passage was published later than the first passage. And uh, the environmental movement described in the first passage was the topic discussed in the second passage. Okay, when we see a pair of passage, the last three or four questions always ask us to find out the relationship between the two passages. Okay, so but from the intro bracket work, we already know the relationship between the two passages. So that can save us a lot of time. Okay, and then when we answer those pair of passage questions. And the second passage is a, uh, the second example uh, says that passage was, a, uh, was an exception from a novel. So it's a, you know, it's a literature passage in 1985. So that's a modern novel. And then you can also see the main characters here are three women. Okay, three women are discussing the relationships. So you can expect probably the passage will tell us the names of these three women. So later on, when you look at the questions and you know that, so these are the main characters. Sometimes um, in addition to the main characters, the passage will uh, also describe secondary characters. Okay, but the main character is like a main topic in a story. Okay, so you need to know the personality or the, uh, the habits of the main characters and the relationship between the main characters and possibly the relationship between the main characters and the secondary characters. And then finally, uh, it's a social science passage. This passage is taken from a 1905 article by a doctor describing medical technologies available in certain hospitals. So the main topic is what? New medical technologies in the context of some hospitals. Okay, social science passage. Okay, um, the second thing, uh, second most important thing that you need, uh, need to do is to focus on the big picture and the tone. Okay, SAT reading tests more questions that rely on the main topic and main idea, because they want you to, um, they they want you to see the thread that connects the entire story. Even for evidence questions, okay, if you see one an one answer choice that uh, basically contradictory to the main idea, no matter how uh, uh, like uh, no matter how much you like it, you have to eliminate it because the main topic cannot change, okay? So sometimes, and later I will show an example, and the students tend to be confused with what other people say and then what the author, him or herself thinks, okay? So uh, especially in social science passage, uh, because those authors are not very arrogant. They, don't, they will not just tell you what they themselves think, right? They, they sometimes start telling you what other people think. And if you think, if you got the main idea wrong, too bad, and you're gonna miss a lot of problems in that passage. Okay, so uh, also pay attention to uh, ma major transition strong language. Most of the time it's contrast, okay? But sometimes it's the, uh, it's the extent of the previous, uh, a previous idea. So that means moving forward in the same direction. But most of the time it's a major contrast. So you're looking for words that tell you the major transition, especially the contrast, so if, uh, for example, but, however, however, nevertheless, Okay, so when you see those words, you have to be on guard. Most likely after those words, you can see the author's main idea. Okay, so make sure that you differentiate what other people say and what author thinks. And uh, we need to, of course, we need to get what the author thinks. Okay, most people, what other people say are not important while we are doing, while uh, we are doing the problems. Okay, so here is a, uh, again, example, of course, uh, uh, today I will not ask you to read this. I just want to tell you that now the title of the passage or the original title of the original source of the passage is philosophy isn't dead yet. Okay, so from this title, we know that the main topic is philosophy. The tone is negative. And uh, so that means the, authors, the author writes this article, a passage to refute some claim saying that philosophy is dead. Okay, so if you get that main idea, then when you see the beginning of the first paragraph, you know that that shows, that cannot be the author's point of view. It has to be what other people say, right? It says uh, in 2010, basically some people announced that philosophy was dead because whatever reason, 
you don't even need to continue reading. So you know that this paragraph talks about what other people think. Then move on to the second paragraph. The view has significant support among philosophies in English speaking work. Okay, so again, this describes the supporters of the above view, still what other people think. And then finally, to the third paragraph, and you see that paragraph start with a contrast, but. Okay, now we have to read carefully and see whether after the but, we see the author's own opinion. Okay, so you can see, but there could not be a worse time for philosophies to surrender the patent of metaphysical inquiry to physicist, fundamental physics in a metaphysical mass and needs help. Okay, so you know that this, the sentence after the but, direct contrast what the, uh, the first par two paragraph tell us. Okay, so after but tells us the main idea of the author's view. Okay, so this is the main idea of the passage. Okay, so we can, in this case, we find the main idea in the third paragraph. Okay, some students, they read the first paragraph, they read the second paragraph, well, they see the first paragraph, the first paragraphs have the same viewpoint. They thought that the main idea uh, is actually philosophy was in trouble. Okay, and then they got the, the other people's view. So pay attention to strong transitions, okay? Okay, number three, please pay attention to context. We say context is key in SAT reading because even if the problem tells us the line number, the answer cannot come from line, that line number. Okay, even for vocab problem, okay? So even for vocab problem, basically all the problems, if you see a problem with a line number, the answer is not found in that line number. You have to read at least two sentences before and the two sentences after to get a broader context in order to answer that question correctly. Okay, here is again as an example. Uh, I'm not gonna go, go over that in detail, but I just want to tell you, well, in this case, the question actually is very nice. It said, in the context of conversation between Nawab and Haroni, Nawab's comments in lines 43 to 52, it gives you the line number, okay, but the answer does not come from the, those, um, the, 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 uh, the lines that you see between these two, the words that you see in between these two lines. It asks you, um, Nawab's comments, many serve to. This is what we call function problem. Function problem, inference questions, are the most challenging problems for students. I would say most tricky problems for students because students tend to read the lines, the words or the sentences between the lines and the find the answer based on the lines. So I can just show you, okay, without going into the uh, context, we want to show you how tricky the answer choice can be. So, sir, I beg you, right? So it's just right here. Um, I, uh, sir, enough. I beg you, forgive my weakness. And better a darkened house and a proud hunger within than disgrace in the life day. Release me, I ask you, I beg. If you just read these few lines, you will think, oh, so this person is making comments so that uh, he wants to tell um, uh, uh, his landlord that he wants to go, right? He wants to quit his job. And guess what? There's one answer choice waiting for you. Notify Harani that Nawab intends to quit his job tending the tube wells. Okay, but that's not the right answer. In fact, um, well, this, this guy is a little bit so sneaky and he said those words, want to tell um, his landlord how loyal and how reliable he is. And he wants to ask for something from the landlord. It's like a threatening. Okay, but how can you tell? You have to read a context in order to know the purpose why the person says this. You cannot just read the line by just read these few lines. If you just read these few, uh, a few lines, you will pick the right answer choice. Okay, so that's about the reading. And then now I move on to the math part. Okay, uh, we all know that there are two math sections, one calculator allowed, uh, one uh, one section does not allow calculator. Um, I want to tell you the question, uh, the contents or the things that you need to know to do well in SAT math. There are four main content areas. Hard algebra and the past part of advanced math are both algebra. So hard algebra is basically everything linear, okay? Usually uh, in the traditional math education, that's algebra one. 
maybe in integrated uh, math is uh, integrated math uh, one or two, okay? And the passport, uh, passport to advanced math is algebra two or nonlinear algebra. So these two together accounts for about 61% of all the problems. They are evenly divided in the calculus section and the non-calculus section. And the third main category are the one that accounts for the most in the remaining parts of problem solving and the data analysis. And that part accounts for 30%. And those questions only appear in the calculator section. This is also the reason why when you suddenly move on to the calculus section, you feel that it's another reading section, but it's a math reading, okay? Um, because those questions are long. These are real life application problems. We know that in real applications, we need to know the background information. We need to know why, um, uh, why, why there's a problem that we need to solve, okay? So those questions are very long and uh, multi-step questions. And then finally, uh, there are 10% questions that uh, we call advanced topics in math, which basically cover a little bit geometry, trigonometry, not the trigonometry you learn in um, the actual trigonometry class, but just write a trigonometry and write triangles and the uh, complex numbers. Okay, so this, um, uh, this part accounts for 10% and even divided between the character section and the non-character section. Now, the reason why I want to show you the breakdown of those questions between the two sections is that we have less time per question in the non calc section, okay? So you can expect that the questions in the non calc sections are more straightforward, cannot be too complicated, cannot be too long. Okay, so here are the rules of SAT math. SAT math is not hard at all, okay? And uh, uh, we have seen students who uh, uh, who achieve perfect score at ninth grade, okay? As long, basically, as long as you have learned algebra two, you are ready to take SAT math. Okay, um, actually the, the more advanced topics you learn in math classes, uh, probably the worse because you're moving away from the, the basic ones. However, SAT math is very tricky. And just a couple of weeks ago, I helped a student who even qualified for Amy at eighth grade. So you know how brilliant she was, how strong her math was, but she didn't get a perfect score uh, when she did diagnosis test in SAT math. Actually with, with the two tests, she, did a perfect, she didn't get a perfect score. Okay, of course, when she look at a problem the second time, she was able to figure out uh, why she made a mistake without my help at all. Okay, so the, course, the questions are very tricky. And 60% of questions are algebra questions. So that means in order to do well in this test, you need to be very strong in algebra thinking. Like I said, most of the problems in the character sections are long word problems because SAT math now plays very heavy emphasis on real problem solving skills. So these are the very long word problems. If you hate word problems, that's a bad news for you, okay? So this is when you have to, when you start preparing for SAT, you have to train yourself to have the patience going through the problems step by step. Please don't jump steps. And uh, although just one section, that allows, the cal uh, allows us to use calculator. But I think a calculator is actually useless. Why well, you shouldn't have it read on the calculator because even for the calculator section, they test us understanding of concepts rather than the calculation part. Okay, so you feel that if you feel that self, you are immersed with the calculation, something's wrong. Okay, the calculation should be very straightforward even in the calculator section. And the last part, you really have to pay attention to details. Okay, especially in the math section. Not so much pay attention to details in the passage for SAT reading, but for math, every word with mathematical meaning makes difference. If you skip one word or you misinterpret one word with mathematical meaning, too bad. You will solve the problem wrong. Okay, so I, um, I show this picture uh, several times to students just to tell them the difference between the SAT reading and the reading SAT math. Okay, like I said, in the calculus section, um, the problems are very long. Okay, so for SAT reading, for SAT math reading, you actually have to zoom in. You have to be very careful with every word, what with mathematical meaning, okay? What without mathematical meaning does not affect you. So the word, each word with mathematical meaning, you have to really pay attention. Please pay attention until the very end of the question. Many times students make mistakes, 
is because they answer the wrong problem. Okay, so I, I, I think it because they designed that trick to make the, the, the problem itself very tricky. For example, most of the time when we solve equation, we, re, uh, we solve for x, but the question asks for two times x. Okay, so if you have that preconcept say, thinking that, oh, I solved the equation, I solve for x, and without reading question carefully enough, too bad. Okay, there's a one answer choice waiting for you because they know a lot of students just solve for x and then they thought they are done, right? For x into reading though, you actually want to zoom out. Like I said, don't memorize the details. Don't, uh, don't, don't pay so much attention to the minute details in the passage. Of course, you have to read questions and answer choice carefully. Okay, but in terms of passage, you actually don't want to uh, like uh, you don't want to pay attention to those minute details. You have to zoom out and look at the big picture of the reading passage. Okay, so how to prepare for SAT math? You have to know the test. Okay, uh, uh, so I just showed you the four content, uh, the, the four main content areas that you, you have to know in order to do well in math. So math still has knowledge, right? It does test you, uh, your basic knowledge in, in from your math classes. Um, and uh, you also need to know what will be tested and how you will be tested, the type of question that you're gonna see. Okay, for example, even, uh, even with linear algebra, such a simple concept, they really know how to trick students. Okay, sometimes when a student read a question, they have no idea what they need to do. Like it's not because they don't understand the question, they just don't know what they expect you to do. And you also know your, you need to know yourself, your target score. It's not just for math, okay? For all, for all the sections, you really need to know your target score. So that tells you how much effort you have to put in. If for SAT math, your target score 800, that means zero mistake, okay? Um, sometimes you don't even have a chance to get 790 because sometimes if you make, make one mistake, your score will be deducted by 20 or even 30 points. You need to know your strength, which means that you probably don't need so much time preparing or working through practices um, that is in your strength. Instead, you need to spend more time improving on your weak points. Okay, so yeah, so most importantly, probably now is the time to figure out where your weak areas are and uh, make effort to improve on those areas. So how can you know your weaknesses? Of course, by studying the mistakes of each practice problems, uh, for each practice uh, uh, test you have done. Okay, so here are some of the common um, reasons for mistakes I have seen among our students. Of course, if you have a content, content gap, that means the first thing you're gonna do is to fill that gap. Okay, so for example, some students um, uh, have uh, always make uh, always miss statistical questions. So that means you have a content gap in statistical uh, statistics that you have to fill that, that gap. Time management, that just tells you, you cannot spend too much time with any problem. Okay, there's no problem, not a single problem that worth all your time. Each problem is weighted equally. And that also means that you probably want to, um, if you feel that a problem is hard to solve, or at least you cannot see a problem that you can solve within, uh, within two minutes, that means you are not in the right track. So you should skip and then move on to work on other problems. And after you finish all the other problems, you can come back to this problem. Problem comprehension, okay? So usually uh, that's, um, uh, students have that problem uh, when they encounter problem solving questions, okay? So um, you have just have to get used to how how those questions are phrased, you really need to know what's the underlying math concept being tested in those problems. Test nervousness, if you feel that you tend to be too nervous during, we all feel nervous during a test. It's just like too nervous. If being too nervous can really um, cause some negative impact on our test performance, if that's you, what can you do? You have to do more practice tests, especially mock tests, which I will describe uh, um, uh, in the next slide. So do more mock tests meaning that you don't want to do the practice in your bedroom, which looks comfortable, okay? You want to go to a classroom and you want to go to a place with only desk and the chairs and then do your test there, okay? Just mimic the real test environment. Uh, careless mistake, I have heard a lot of students telling me that, okay, that's a careless mistake. However, this test is designed to punish careless mistakes with all the different traps. This test is not hard but they don't want all students to get 800, right? Therefore, they have to design the traps in the test. Therefore, if you are a very um, careless person 
and you are one of the targets of the, this test. Okay, so please, there's no careless mistake. That's not, that's not an excuse for, make, me, uh, for making mistakes uh, in ICT math. You have to find ways to overcome that problem. Okay, probably that means you always have to double check the answer. Uh, you have to read the question carefully. Uh, you even have to use a pencil to do annotations, so like doing a reading test, right? You annotate the key phrase. Don't miss any important information. You also need to know and to practice with test strategies. So uh, in our classes, we go through all the test strategies with students and also tell them, but well, don't be just content with knowing how to solve a problem. You always want to think, is there a better approach to solving this problem? Okay, so you need to ask this question if you spend more than one minute to solve a problem. All the problems in SAT math can be solved within one minute, less than one minute. If you spend like two minutes solving a problem, yes, you get the right answer, but definitely that's not the best approach. So for example, uh, we, also tell, we always tell students that for a multiple choice questions, you always want to study answer choices before deciding how to solve problems, okay? You don't want to solve the problem all by yourself and then compare your answers with answer choices, okay? Actually, most of the time, you're just halfway into the problem by looking at answer choices, you already know which answer choice must be correct. Okay, ballparking, that means doing ed educated guess. You have a good number of sense. Sometimes the best answer, uh, the best way to solve a problem is not to solve a problem directly, but plugging the answer choice back into the equation you have written. And uh, figures are drawn to scale. So in SAT math, half of the geometry problems are drawn to scale, half probably are not drawn to scale. So for problems, for those geome uh, geometry problems in which the figures are drawn to scales, the scale information can help you to solve a problem, at least can help you to check the answer, right? You don't have to resolve the problem. For long word problems, you need to know how to divide and conquer, okay? That means you take each piece uh, with, math uh, with math mathematical meaning, translate that English into math, and after you have done the translation, based on the very last sentence, which tells us what we need to solve for, you decide how you combine the equations, inequalities that you have written down, and that's how you solve a multi-step problem. You really need to double check the answers, okay? Because by the time when we should reach to the fourth, uh, fourth section, the math calculator section, we are very tight, okay? All, all the students are very tight at that time. And then if they see another section with so many words, like another reading section, some students want to give up, okay? They don't even have the patience to do that, okay? So I, I totally understand um, that could happen uh, with students. That also tells you probably you start making some silly mistakes. Okay, so you need to know how to depth check your answers to catch those silly mistakes. You also need to practice with mock tests. So complete tests under the real setting, for strictly following the time. Okay, you cannot just give yourself a little bit like a couple of minutes more and, and then cut some uh, uh, the break. Okay, so we always tell students, if I give you the break, for example, after reading, between reading and the writing section, just 10 minutes break. Please take full use of those 10 minutes. Don't want to just get the test down and then say, okay, I don't need a break. And then I just go after the reading, I move directly to writing. And then once you get to the math section, I, I think the brain is so tired and you start making all kinds of weird mistakes. Again, okay, later on, you will regret you did that. Okay, so strict photo timing and then to practice and then build your uh, stamina with a test. This entire test is four hours, okay, very long test. So you have to train your body to have that patience and stamina to sit through the entire test and then not lose your accuracy toward the end. Okay, and uh, finally, I want to tell you that uh, how we design our courses to help students who target the March test. But it, of course, for students who want to take the May test, and uh, you can also uh, follow this flow. We know that as all students uh, come with different, uh, uh, with different starting points. Okay, some students, therefore we always ask our students to do a pre-diagnosis test and to see where they stand. Before, stay, before they spend time preparing for the test. So for those students who, uh, who scores above 1400, and then that means they are ready to shoot for 1500. So they can sign up for our SAT 1500 plus strategy class. And after the class, 
and we give the post class assessment and to evaluate the progress. Uh, and we will give students and parents suggestions on how to move forward. And then, and, but there are still uh, two months between, uh, there's still two months after, uh, after the, after the uh, last class of this section until the March test and they need to do regular mock test. So we offer students a, a mock test and a review every Saturday. Students can come on any day when they are available, but the more tests you do, the better you will be prepared on the test day. And now for those students who uh, have not achieved 1400, and that means we need to give a little bit more foundational knowledge. Therefore, we design the classes to be a um, little bit longer, but we do give student um, assessment in an, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the winter break, and to see how far they have progressed. If they have progressed significantly, that means they could achieve score uh, above fourteen hundred, and that means probably what they need is the strategy rather than a more foundational knowledge. So we uh, then we uh, we will move those students to our fifteen hundred plus strategy class, and then they're gonna shoot for fifteen hundred. And then for those students who have not ach achieved above 1400, and that means there's still foundational gap there. And then uh, we will uh, continue helping those students with the second stage of the boot camp class. And to, um, but th those group camp, uh, boot camp class includes foundational knowledge as well as the strategies. Just for students who um, have a weaker foundation to start with, that means take a little bit longer time for them to, um, uh, to build up the foundation at the same time, knowing how to effectively apply the strategies we teach them. And all the classes should be followed with a mock test and review because like I said, you really need to know, uh, you really have to train your body to seek through the entire test and not, and not losing your accuracy toward the end. Okay. All right, so uh, I, I think now we are an open the floor for questions and- uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Yan, um, for breaking down our course goal for that picture right there. I'm going to share my screen right now. So, of course, we have our live Q&A for our parents and students that are currently watching. Um, if you guys have any live questions that you personally want to ask right now, you can go ahead and add it to our chat box or our Q&A. And if you don't, we also have common questions in the next slide from parents and students that have sent it to us. But if you do have questions, go ahead and add them in right now. If not, we'll go ahead and go on to the common questions. You can also raise your hand as you guys did previously. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and start with some common questions. Um, and if you guys do have questions as we go on, go ahead and raise your hand or add them to the chat box. So Dr. Yan, um, we know you're short on some time, but if you do um, have mm -hmm. several minutes, um, maybe two to three questions, or you can answer all of them, whatever is most comfortable for you. Um, these are some questions that students and parents typically ask regarding the SAP math, reading, or just overall for examination. Yeah, I will try to answer all the questions. Uh, you can tell I speak very fast. So number one, does <laughs> it matter how many times I take SAT? Well, I think that really depends on the school you are shooting for. So for those very highly competitive schools, for example, Stanford and Harvard and the Princeton, they do look at all your history. Um, so that means they have the, uh, uh, they, they want to see uh, all the SAT tests you have done. So that tells, um, basically, that just tells you if your goal is to those high level schools, you actually don't want to take SAT too many times because that just tell them that you're not, not a very effective uh, learner, right? Who, who would spend so much time just for one test? and how can you survive in a college, yeah. But for other schools, um, uh, theoretically speaking, you can take as many tests uh, as you can, but again, um, your time is very limited as a high school, to, as a high school student. You have some, so many things you're busy with, okay? So don't take too many tests, just for the sake of efficiency. Get ready, okay? So when you, uh, when you decide to take a test, you want to spend time really preparing for the test and then go for it and get it done, maybe, Ideally, you, can, you want to get a task, target score within two tests. Okay. Um, Sorry, give me one second. I think we also have a question from uh -huh. a student. Um, uh -huh. They asked, how do I improve my reading comprehension skills for the history genre passages? 
yeah. the overall um, uh -huh. yeah, reading comprehension uh, skills. Okay. Um, well, I, probably um, uh, so, so for students who asked this question, um, uh, actually in our last week's open class, and uh, teacher Amy told, told us, this is not a reading comprehension test. This is an argument comprehension test. So in other words, you don't have to fully understand that history passage. You just have to know um, the main idea of the, of the passage and how the author use different evidence to support his or her argument. Okay, and of course your reading comprehension will help you, but depending on how much time you have between now and your test date. And uh, if there's only a couple of months left, of course you can read as many history uh, documents as you can, but I, I think now is the time for you to uh, focus on the strategy. See, if you, if you uh, focus on the things that are important in the passage, probably you can answer all the questions correctly with only knowing the main idea and the tone and the main argument not all the details okay if you're only a, a 10th grade student or like ninth grade student and then you have the time to uh, develop your reading comprehension skill which by the way is a very important skill it's not just for this particular test right it will helps you in the long run and then you just read more okay and when you do when you read more don't do don't be a passive reader you want to be active reader and you want to start analyzing what the uh, what author says and to look for the evidence the author, the rhetorical devices the author uses to um, present his or her argument. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Okay, um, any other questions, live questions? Uh, no, that, that was the first one, thank you. Okay, so what is hardest, hardest concept for SAT math? There's no hard, con uh, they're really, really not, not a like a rocket, uh, right, hard concept in SAT math. But based on my experience helping uh, students, I feel that most students have weakness or gaps in data interpretation. I think it's mainly because the, at school, they have not, have, uh, they have not had any systematic um, uh, learning for statistics. So statistics includes analyzing data, design experiment or interpret the results of experiment. Okay, um, so th these are I think many due to content gap, but they are not complicated at all. I can e easily explain students everything they need to know in statistics in 15 minutes, okay, and they can do well. And three, should I read the questions or passage first? Um, well, that I think that, uh, that really depends on how fast you can read, but you never want to read a question not, uh, first before not reading passage at all. At least you want to read the intro paragraph, right? To get the main idea. So if you think you get the main idea and the tone, and then probably you can start reading the questions. But remember, even you read a question, that means you have to go back to the passage to find evidence or um, uh, to read a context. Okay, I have seen students doing well in both ways. So uh, probably that's what the, the, the questions meant. So read the questions, after the intro paragraph, always read the intro paragraph and then go to the questions. And then through the question, they analyze the questions and to see um, what are the main topics that you can tell from the questions and they go back to the passage and then um, focus on the parts of the passage that talk about the main idea. Okay, and also most of students, of course, read the passage first, but like skim through the passage and then move on to the questions. So it's not like a yes or no, it really depends on, you have to try both and to see which, uh, which approach works um, better for you. How long should I spend on SAT? In, like I think I mentioned earlier, um, you should not spend more than one minute. Okay, so if you spend more than two minutes, definitely that means something's, in, uh, something's wrong. It's not because you solved the problem, right? Probably that, that means you didn't use the right approach or the shortcut design for that problem. If I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if I should take SAT mock test strategy review versus all you want. Oh, okay. Now the mock test strategy is for students who already know the test strategy. And the mock test review class is for you to practice the strategies in a real test setting. Like, well, like that simulates a real test setting. Okay, so if you don't have the strategies, like going into the mock test review class will not be most beneficial. Okay, uh, because you could you could miss a lot of problems because you don't even know the strategy. Okay, so uh, so basically, my recommendation is that you actually want to learn the test strategy first, and then and and the mock test uh, review class is the is the time when you can hone your skill and practice with your strategies. And what is considered a good SAT math or reading score? Okay, so this is very subjective. 
Um, but for most students, uh, if you if you are, it also depends on your total target score. For math, of course, if you are uh, rather stronger with math, and that means you want to push your math score as high as possible, ideally 800, but no more than uh, no less than like 770. Okay, and the for reading. Um, but reading and the writing are always combined. So you cannot just look at the reading by itself. So reading and writing combined, uh, full score is 800. Um, of course, 700, above 700 is better. Should I use the same strategy for SAT and the ACT? Well, tomorrow's the ACT test, okay? Um, yes, for the reading section, because uh, both, both SAT and uh, reading sections are objective tests. Both rely on evidence from the passages. There's, key dif uh, there's some key difference between the two, uh, two tests though, uh, is that ACT number one is much, for pa uh, much faster paced. Um, second of all, there are less evidence question, a few evidence questions in ACT compared to SAT. And that's also the reason why SAT gave us more time. The questions in SAT, I would say, uh, I would say uh, more complicated. And for student, uh, um, the student who asked for the history passage, the good news for you, for you is that ACT does not have history passage. Okay, ACT only has social science, humanities, um, uh, the humanities passage, and the science passage, uh, literature, uh, but no history passages. So for those students who definitely hate history passages, you may want to go for ACT. How should I decide what to do one-on-one -on, -one on group lessons? Uh, again, it, depend, it really depends on uh, where starting point is, what your starting point is. Uh, for, for, for those students who have, still have a very large room to, to improve, I would suggest you start from group lessons because with group lessons, we go over all the strategies systematically. For math, we go over all the important concepts, all the tricky questions systematically. So that means we don't want to leave any gap. And then one-on-one -on -one is for students, uh, for helping students with unique needs. For example, you're already very uh, way above average, and then just certain areas that we need to uh, focus on improving. And the one-on-one -on -one classes, of course, in, uh, in that sense, is more effective. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Yan. Uh, you're welcome. Yes, so we're going to go ahead and move forward. Oh, there's one we... question here. Uh, oh, so yeah. from a, yeah. Uh, is mock test included in the all-in-one? I have to buy separately. Uh, so for all all-in-one strategy class, we have we give out two mock tests. One at the beginning before they uh, before the students start the class, so we can see where the student stands, and then we always go over that mock test in our first class. And then we also give a student a mock test right after uh, the all-in-one strategy class is over, and to see where they stand. But then afterwards, and the the mock test class, the mock test classes are separate. Yeah, so the mock test review class, uh, as you see, is a, is a separate class because we do that mock test in the morning and the review in the afternoon. Yes, we hope that answered your question. If you have more, please go ahead and add it to the chat box and we'll help you answer those. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on forward to introduce some of our December courses that are starting this next week, actually. Here we are. So this upcoming December, just next week, we bring to you um, two new courses. They are going to be the SAT 1500 Plus All-in-One Strategy, as well as the ACT 35 Plus All-in-One Strategy. So these are specialized courses that are taught in small group classes, as Dr. Yan mentioned. So students will receive maximum and focused attention from their instructors. Both of these courses include lectures with Q&A after each section and a teacher assistant that is available for the students at all times. There is a pre-test and post-class assessment to measure your academic improvement as well. So you can gauge how you've improved over time through these courses. And if you look to our right, we have instructor June that is teaching our SAT Fit Tearing Plus course. She has helped students improve their SAT from 1,500 to 1,500, or sorry, 1,500 to 1,580 in only 10 hours. She's helped over 30,000 students to ensure full test marks for many of our learners. Instructor Amy has a strong academic background from UCLA as well as the University of Chicago. Amy, with Amy's strategy, students have increased over 100 points for the SAT reading and writing. And Dr. Yan, as you guys have seen through this open class, is a tenured college professor and she has over 18 years of teaching experience and the results, that, and the results to prove it. 80% of her students achieve a full 800 on SAT math. 
and we have also teacher Colin. Colin has over 10 years of experience educating students at both the middle school and high school level. Colin's expert credentials have helped students in his AP physics courses. They achieved a passing rate that is double the national average. So on both of these flyers, we have QR codes on the bottom of them, as well as our phone number and website. If you wanted to learn about either of these courses or have further questions about how they work, their structure, or any other questions relating to the course, feel free to scan the QR code or give us a call at 408-216-9109. Um, and let me go ahead and see here. We're going to move on over to the last part of our open class, which is for all of our lucky viewers that stay to the very end. We do this for every open class. It's a secret $50 discount on your next 7 EDU group class. If you send over the code 1213 to our WeChat account that is on that QR, you can go ahead and use that coupon code for your next 7 EDU group class. It's only invalid until the end of December. So if you want the discount, go ahead and call the number that's on our screen. And of course, a free 30 minute consultation for all of our viewers. If you're interested at all for any test prep or academic guidance, go ahead and give us a call at 408-216-9109 to schedule your free 30 minute consultation. And I will also leave this page up for a while so that way you guys can go ahead and get the details. And if you have further questions, we will also be here for five to 10 minutes after this. That will conclude the open class for today. Thank you so much for watching and we wish good luck to all the students that are taking the ACT test tomorrow.